This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy Book 5 The Discovery 7 The Night of the Sixth of November Having resolved on flight, Eustatia, at times, seemed anxious that something should happen to thwart her own intention. The only event that could really change her position was the appearance of Klim. The glory which had encircled him as her lover was departed now, yet some good, simple quality of his would occasionally return to her memory and stir a momentary throb of hope that he would again present himself before her. But, calmly considered, it was not likely that such a severance as now existed would ever close up. She would have to live on as a painful object, isolated and out of place. She had used to think of the heath alone as an uncongenial spot to be in. She felt it now of the whole world. Towards evening on the 6th, her determination to go away again revived. About four o'clock she packed up anew the few small articles she had brought in her flight from Alderworth, and also some belonging to her which had been left here. The whole formed a bundle not too large to be carried in her hand for a distance of a mile or two. The scene without grew darker. Mud-coloured clouds bellied downwards from the sky like vast hammocks slung across it and with the increase of night a stormy wind arose. But as yet there was no rain. Eustatia could not rest indoors, having nothing more to do, and she wandered to and fro on the hill, not far from the house she was soon to leave. In these desultory ramblings she passed the cottage of Susan Nunsuch, a little lower down than her grandfather's. The door was ajar, and a riband of bright firelight fell over the ground without. As Eustatia crossed the fire-beams, she appeared, for an instant, as distinct as a figure in a phantasmagoria, a creature of light surrounded by an area of darkness. The moment passed, and she was absorbed in night again. A woman who was sitting inside the cottage had seen and recognized her in that momentary irradiation. This was Susan herself, occupied in preparing a posset for her little boy, who, often ailing, was now seriously unwell. Susan dropped the spoon, shook her fist at the vanished figure, and then proceeded with her work in a musing, absent way. At eight o'clock, the hour at which Eustatia had promised to signal to Wild Eve, if ever she signalled at all, she looked around the premises to learn if the coast was clear, went to the firs rick, and pulled thence a long-stemmed bough of that fuel. This she carried to the corner of the bank, and, glancing behind to see if the shutters were all closed, she struck a light and kindled the firs. When it was thoroughly ablaze, Eustatia took it by the stem and waved it in the air above her head, till it had burned itself out. She was gratified, if gratification were possible to such a mood, by seeing a similar light in the vicinity of Wild Eve's residence a minute or two later. Having agreed to keep watch at this hour every night in case she should require assistance, this promptness proved how strictly he had held to his word. Four hours after the present time, that is, at midnight, he was to be ready to drive her to Budmouth, as prearranged. Eustatia returned to the house. Supper having been got over, she retired early, and sat in her bedroom, waiting for the time to go by. The night being dark and threatening, 
Captain Vi had not strolled out to gossip in any cottage, or to call at the inn, as was sometimes his custom on these long autumn nights, and he sat sipping grog alone downstairs. About ten o'clock there was a knock at the door. When the servant opened it, the rays of the candle fell upon the form of Fairway. Uh, "'I was a forced to go to Lower Mist over to-night,' he said. "'And Mr. Yobright asked me to leave this here on my way, "'but, faith, I put it in the lining of my hat "'and thought no more about it till I got back "'and was hasping my gate before going to bed. "'So I've run back with it at once.' "'He handed in a letter and went his way. "'The girl brought it to the captain, who found that it was directed to Eustatia. He turned it over and over, and fancied that the writing was her husband's, though he could not be sure. However, he decided to let her have it at once, if possible, and took it upstairs for that purpose. But on reaching the door and looking in at the keyhole, he found there was no light within, the fact being that Eustatia, without undressing, had flung herself upon the bed, to rest and gather a little strength for her coming journey. Her grandfather concluded, from what he saw, that he ought not to disturb her. And descending again to the parlour, he placed the letter on the mantelpiece to give it to her in the morning. At eleven o'clock he went to bed himself, smoked for some time in his bedroom, put out his light at half-past eleven, and then, as was his invariable custom, pulled up the blind before getting into bed that he might see which way the wind blew on opening his eyes in the morning, his bedroom window commanding a view of the flagstaff and vane. Just as he had lain down, he was surprised to observe the white pole of the staff flash into existence like a streak of phosphorus drawn downwards across the shade of night without. Only one explanation met this. A light had been suddenly thrown upon the pole, from the direction of the house. As everybody had retired to rest, the old man felt it necessary to get out of bed, open the window softly, and look to the right and left. Eustatia's bedroom was lighted up, and it was the shine from her window which had lighted the pole. Wondering what had aroused her, he remained undecided at the window, and was thinking of fetching the letter to slip it under her door, when he heard a slight brushing of garments on the partition dividing his room from the passage. The captain concluded that Eustatia, feeling wakeful, had gone for a book, and would have dismissed the matter as unimportant if he had not also heard her distinctly weeping as she passed. "'She's thinking of that husband of hers,' he said to himself. Ah, oh, the silly goose! She'd no business to marry him. I wonder if that letter is really his. He arose, threw his boat cloak round him, opened the door, and said, Eustacia! There was no answer. Eustacia! he repeated louder. There's a letter on the mantelpiece for you. But no response was made to this statement save an imaginary one from the wind, which seemed to gnaw at the corners of the house, and the stroke of a few drops of rain upon the windows. He went on to the landing, and stood waiting nearly five minutes. Still she did not return. He went back for a light, and prepared to follow her, but first he looked into her bedroom. There, on the outside of the quilt, was the impression of her form showing that the bed had not been opened and, what was more significant, she had not taken her candlestick downstairs. He was now thoroughly alarmed, and hastily putting on his clothes, he descended to the front door, which he himself had bolted and locked. It was now unfastened. There was no longer any doubt that Eustatia had left the house at this midnight hour, and whither could she have gone? To follow her was almost impossible. Had the dwelling stood in an ordinary road, 
two persons setting out, one in each direction, might have made sure of overtaking her. But it was a hopeless task to seek for anybody on a heath in the dark, the practicable directions for flight across it from any point being as numerous as the meridians rad radiating from the pole. Perplexed what to do, he looked into the parlour, and was vexed to find that the letter still lay there, untouched. At half-past eleven, finding that the house was silent, Eustacia had lighted her candle, put on some warm outer wrappings, taken her bag in her hand, and, extinguishing the light again, descended the staircase. When she got into the outer air, she found that it had begun to rain, and as she stood pausing at the door, it increased, threatening to come on heavily. But having committed herself to this line of action, there was no retreating for bad weather. Even the receipt of Klim's letter would not have stopped her now. The gloom of the night was funereal. All nature seemed clothed in crepe. The spiky points of the fir trees behind the house rose into the sky like the turrets and pinnacles of an abbey. Nothing below the horizon was visible, save a light which was still burning in the cottage of Susan Nunsuch. <clears throat> Eustacia opened her umbrella and went out from the enclosure by the steps over the bank, after which she was beyond all danger of being perceived. Skirting the pool, she followed the path towards Rainbarrow, occasionally stumbling over twisted furze roots, tufts of rushes, or oozing lumps of fleshy fungi, which at this season lay scattered about the heath like the rotten liver and lungs of some colossal animal. The moon and stars were closed up by cloud and rain to the degree of extinction. It was a night which led the traveller's thoughts instinctively to dwell on nocturnal scenes of disaster in the chronicles of the world, on all that is terrible and dark in history and legend, the last plague of Egypt, the destruction of Sennacherib's host, the agony in Gethsemane. Eustacia at length reached Rainbarrow and stood still there to think. Never was harmony more perfect than that between the chaos of her mind and the chaos of the world without. A sudden recollection had flashed on her this moment. She had not money enough for undertaking a long journey. Amid the fluctuating sentiments of the day, her unpractical mind had not dwelt on the necessity of being well provided. And now that she thoroughly realized the conditions, she sighed bitterly and ceased to stand erect, gradually crouching down under the umbrella, as if she were drawn into the barrow by a hand from beneath. Could it be that she was to remain a captive still? Money! She had never felt its value before. Even to efface herself from the country, means were required. To ask Wild Eve for pecuniary aid without allowing him to accompany her was impossible to a woman with a shadow of pride left in her. To fly as his mistress, and she knew that he loved her, was of the nature of humiliation. Anyone who had stood by now would have pitied her not so much on account of her exposure to weather and isolation from all of humanity, except the moulded remains inside the tumulus, but for that other form of misery which was denoted by the slightly rocking movements that her feelings imparted to her person. Extreme unhappiness weighed visibly upon her. Between the drippings of the rain, from her umbrella to her mantle, from her mantle to the heather, from the heather to the earth, very similar sounds could be heard coming from her lips, and the tearfulness of the outer scene was repeated upon her face. The wings of her soul were broken by the cruel obstructiveness of all about her, and even had she seen herself in a promising way of getting to Budmouth, entering a steamer, and sailing to some opposite port, she would have been but little more buoyant so fearfully malignant 
were other things. She uttered words aloud. When a woman in such a situation, neither old, deaf, crazed, nor whimsical, takes it upon herself to sob and soliloquize aloud, there is something grievous the matter. Can I go? Can I go? she moaned. He's not great enough for me to give myself to. He does not suffice for my desire. If he had been a Saul or a Bonaparte, oh, but, but to break my marriage vow for him, it is too poor a luxury. And I have no money to go alone, and if I could, what comfort to me? I must drag on next year as I have dragged on this year, and the year after that, as before. Oh, how I, how I have tried and tried to be a splendid woman, and how destiny has been against me. I do not deserve my lot, she cried in a frenzy of bitter revolt. Oh, the cruelty of putting me into this ill-conceived world! I was capable of much, but I have been injured and blighted and crushed by things beyond my control. Oh, how hard it is of heaven to devise such tortures for me, who have done no harm to heaven at all! The distant light which Eustatia had cursorily observed in leaving the house came, as she had divined, from the cottage window of Susan Nunsuch. What Eustatia did not divine was the occupation of the woman within at that moment. Susan's sight of her passing figure earlier in the evening, not five minutes after the sick boy's exclamation, "'Mother, I do feel so bad!' persuaded the matron that an evil influence was certainly exercised by Eustatia's propinquity. On this account, Susan did not go to bed as soon as the evening's work was over, as she would have done at ordinary times. To counteract the malign spell which she imagined poor Eustatia to be working, the boy's mother busied herself with a ghastly invention of superstition, calculated to bring powerlessness, atrophy, and annihilation on any human being against whom it was directed. It was a practice well known on Egdon at that date, and one that is not quite extinct at the present day. She passed with her candle into an inner room where, among other utensils, were two large brown pans containing together perhaps a hundredweight of liquid honey, the produce of the bees during the foregoing summer. On a shelf over the pans was a smooth and solid yellow mass of a hemispherical form consisting of beeswax from the same take of honey. Susan took down the lump, and cutting off several thin slices, heaped them in an iron ladle, with which she returned to the living room and placed the vessel in the hot ashes of the fireplace. As soon as the wax had softened to the plasticity of dough, she kneaded the pieces together, and now her face became more intent. She began moulding the wax, and it was evident from her manner of manipulation that she was endeavouring to give it some preconceived form. The form was human. By warming and, and kneading, cutting and twisting, dismembering and rejoining the incipient image, she had, in about a quarter of an hour, Produced, produced a shape which tolerably well resembled a woman, and was about six inches high. She laid it on the table to get cold and hard. Meanwhile she took the candle and went upstairs to where the little boy was lying. "'Did you notice, my dear, what Mrs. Eustacia wore this afternoon besides the, red, the dark dress?' "'A red ribbon round her neck.' "'Anything else?' No, except sandal shoes. Red ribbon and sandal shoes, she said to herself. Mrs. Nunsuch went and searched 
till she found a fragment of the narrowest red ribbon which she took downstairs and tied round the, round the neck of the image. Then, fetching ink and quill from the rickety bureau by the window, she blackened the feet of the image to the extent presumably covered by shoes, and on the instep of each foot marked cross lines in the shape taken by the sandal strings of those days. Finally, she tied a bit of black thread round the upper part of the head, in faint resemblance to a snood worn for confining the hair. Susan held the object at arm's length and contemplated it with a satisfaction in which there was no smile. To anybody acquainted with the inhabitants of Egdon Heath, the image would have suggested Eustacia Yobright. From her work basket in the window seat, the woman took a paper of pins of the old long and yellow sort whose heads were disposed to come off at their first usage. These she began to thrust into the image in all directions, with apparently excruciating energy. Probably as many as fifty were thus inserted, some into the head of the wax model, some into the shoulders, some into the trunk, some upwards through the soles of the feet, till the figure was completely permeated with pins. She turned to the fire. It had been of turf, and though the high heap of ashes which turf fires produce was somewhat dark and dead on the outside, upon raking it abroad with the shovel, the inside of the mass showed a glow of red heat. She took a few pieces of fresh turf from the chimney corner and built them together over the glow, upon which the fire brightened. Seizing with the tongs the image that she had made of Eustacia, she held it in the heat, and watched it as it began to waste slowly away. And while she stood thus engaged, there came from between her lips a murmur of words. T'was a strange jargon, the Lord's Prayer repeated backwards, the incantation usual in proceedings for obtaining unhallowed assistance against an enemy. Susan uttered the lugubrious discourse three times slowly, and when it was completed the image had considerably diminished. As the wax dropped into the fire, a long flame arose from the spot, and curling its tongue round the figure, ate still further into its substance. A pin occasionally dropped with the wax, and the embers heated it red as it lay. End of chapter 7